Greetings, I'm Sonny Fox. Tonight, a one-hour Superstars Radio Network special. Yes Music, an evening with John Anderson. Interviewed by national radio consultant Lee Abrams. We'll cover the entire history of Yes from the beginning to the present. From their first album to their present. It's a fascinating show, and we'll begin right after this pause. And now, John Anderson. Beautiful. In your musical, let's say, infant, uh, when you were a musical infant, your yeah. first record started giving you rushes, the first kind of record that moved you. What type of music or what type well, of music? Well, there was... Uh, I mean, this is back to grade school. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Everly Brothers. Everly Brothers. Yeah, and Elvis and Eddie Cochran. And generally, generally the Everly Brothers because of the, the kind of harmonizing and the melody lines and things like that. <laughs> and Bing Crosby. And Bing Crosby. <laughs> that's, that's quite, that's just odd because you think of John Anderson like Mr. Stravinsky when he was six or something. Oh, really? It would have been tremendous uh, yeah. to be, to be aware of that. I always liked to, to listen to uh, kind of very emotional classical music because I'd listen to it at the, by the radio mm -hmm. and go through this kind of uh, dying routine. <laughs> yeah. You know, any heavy kind of romantic music, I always used to kind of crawl up into a bowl and just kind of try to disappear right. into the music because right. it was... It would have been wonderful, I guess, to have that kind of musical depth at an early age. Oh, right. How yeah. about the early uh, so-called orchestral groups with Vanilla Fudge and uh, Nice? Were they much of an influence? In oh, oh, totally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. I think Vanilla Fudge's first album was such a, a breakthrough for a band like that. And it was a very strong influence on a lot of people in so many ways. At that point in time, when the, the kind of uh, things were developing towards the end of the 60s at that time. About 68, I think, Vanilla Fudge came with the album. And it was so well orchestrated, in a way, um, that uh, it set a lot of people going off on these kind of ideas. And the Nice, again, they used uh, the actual classics to reproduce on stage and because they were classic uh, pieces of music anyway uh, just to hear them in a club was heavy yeah. it was a real uh, exciting period hmm. 68 yeah, about 60, 67 68 right. how about uh, the Beatles when they sort of uh, transferred from the rock into the more conceptual stuff like Sgt. Pepper well that yeah like that. I think that that had such that a heavy. Started at all, I guess. Really, yeah. well, the Beatles uh, initially got a lot of people out of the kind of possible mundane situation to get into uh, going seeing bands, being in bands, and going seeing groups and being in groups. And it was like uh, that revolution that they were they were always hinting at was happening, and, and they were kind of the the actual. Uh, pushers of that yeah. and they were they were front runners along with a lot of other uh, fine kind of musicians of the time you know the Beach Boys and uh, Stone, Zappa all pushing but the Beatles were like a strong pinnacle for th millions of people right. and for mi thousands of musicians millions of musicians what were your early groups? Warrior and Gun. I hear that something violent. Oh, right. The Warriors, they were kind of a uh, band from the hometown. And we were a very uh, well-rehearsed band. And we, we did the Beatles like the Beatles. And we did the Stones like the Stones. And uh, Four Tops like the Four Tops. And Beach Boys like the Beach Boys as much as we could. Because that was the early training we get into, too. Yeah. And... Um, very exciting times, very youthful, uh, kind of whizzing around in broken down vans and things for about five years. 
uh, touring Europe and so on. At that point uh, in time when we were in Germany, um, I decided to leave the band and uh, I wanted to travel around the world at the time. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go, go off and seek my kind of existence somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, when I came back to London, I started looking for a, a group to work with. Having seen so many groups in London, there was one group called Gun, The Gun, and they were just reforming again. Mm -hmm. They'd been together as a band for about two years, and then they were reforming again. So I got involved for about two months, and that was all, really. Oh. It, we did two gigs. Uh, very exciting gigs. We, we, we played once with uh, the family and once with the Who. Mm. It can't be bad. I mean, they were big. <laughs> I mean, the family was, was a very big uh, English band mm -hmm. and uh, for a long time. Rick Rex band, wasn't Yeah. Now, you always hear these stories about uh, the Yes fans about uh, you were a bartender and you met Chris Squire in a club. Yeah. And that was the beginning of Yes. Right. In some ways, it was. <laughs> Working in uh, the Shas Club, which is in Warder Street, the music area of uh, Soho, the Marquis there, and a few other clubs. And all the musicians would go to the Shas Club for after and before gig drinks, kind of thing. And I was uh, kind of hanging in there and helping out, just generally look, looking for a gig, but in the meantime, helping out in this small club. And uh, that's where we got to meet a lot of musicians, and we started to. I started to see what was going on, and uh, just biding my time. And then there was that uh, fateful afternoon. It was just me and Chris in the bar. I was at one end of the bar, and Chris was at the other end of the bar, and we'd never met. And my friend Jack Barry, who now runs the Marquee Club, as it happens, he was managing that Shas Club, and he said, "You've got to come and." meet this guy over here, he's a bass player, he's getting a band together, I think you could get it together. And so he introduced us, and uh, we just chatted for about half an hour, and I went round to his house and we sang some songs together. And uh, that's how we realised there was every possibility that we should work together. Who was the next member to join the band? If I remember, um, Tony Kay. All right. How did you find uh, Tony? Well, Tony was um, he was known to uh, Chris Squire, and it's funny that I knew I'd, I'd, I worked with Tony about three years previously with the Warriors. He was with another band, so when we met, we we knew of each other. Started rehearsing down in uh, Shaftesbury Avenue. It was a small. Uh, cafe. It was in the basement of a cafe, and the cafe was called the Lucky Horseshoe. And then the next step was to find a, a drummer. We saw an advertisement in the Melody Maker for a drummer. So we rang him up and I asked him what kind of kit he had. Because I think if it, at that time I was thinking, well, if, if he is good, it's got to be a little good kit that he's got. And if he isn't good, he's got a, you know, a, a cheaper kit, which is a silly way of thinking, <laughs> things, you know. 
And he said he had a, a love with kid. Oh, was it the one that was painted? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't a love with kid, but it was. <laughs> That was Bill, and uh, Peter Banks came along, who was uh, a friend of Chris's. And Chris had mentioned Peter a couple of times, and uh, but he was busy with another band. Mm -hmm. But eventually he came along, and we got into rehearsing for a month, and that's how we got on the road. <laughs> Yes Music, An Evening with John Anderson. A Superstars Radio Network special will continue right after this pause. Back in, I guess it was 69, the first trade, yes, back in high school, I guess it was. Everybody thought, God, where are these guys at? Wow. Were you, as a band, sort of part of the whole psychedelic drug trip back then? You know? Not as a group, no. I think individually we all went through our changes in, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, each member of the group had uh, dabbled, as you say, in, in various kind of things. I think, I think that's what uh, made us, because we were all pretty seasoned professionals at that time. We'd all been in the game for about six, seven years, eight years maybe. And uh, it just seemed natural to work hard, to get into a lot of uh, entertainment side of things, uh, musically and staging and everything. And that's possibly how we, we felt, well, there's so many bands are getting together and splitting up. Well, we're going to get together. We're going to work hard. So we've got something there. And there's, there's not, that's going to keep us going. Yeah. And that's what a, a, a lot of rehearsals can do for a band. If you work pretty hard on your rehearsals, then you've got something to stand by. You can all, all look at it and say, well, we've created that. Let's stick to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just always curious, because I'll never forget those early days when we first heard you so imaginative. Yeah. Where'd they get that? Um, you know, the first album, yes. Who was Paul Clay? Is that the guy who produced it? Yeah, he, he was um, a guy that was introduced to us via Atlantic Records when we first signed to Atlantic Records. We, we'd heard about what producers could do for a band, and uh, George Martins of this world there were very few and far between. So when we were introduced to Paul Clay, we just I accepted the fact that he was a producer and he was going to help create the eventual sound on the record and so on. And uh, to go in a new group into studios and do an album, first album, is, is always so exciting that you, you just wound up in the whole thing. And that's the way it came out, that uh, there could have been a lot more sound production, but basically it was what we were at that time. We weren't uh, over sure about what produ produ a producer's job was, so we accepted whatever happened. Mm. And uh, in retrospect, when we look back at, at that time, um, <clears throat> a, little more, a little bit more musical uh, help, recording-wise, would have helped a lot. <laughs> it was, it was uh, fresh, in a way. How long were you together before you recorded that? About six months. Um, did you feel comfortable with the final product? We weren't sure, again, I'm not, we weren't aware of what better things could come out. Because we weren't shown anything better, we accepted it. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously when you put it next to another record, you think, gosh, that isn't really a good sound. So that's one of the things that we felt later. But at the time, it was uh, all that we'd heard of ourselves on record, so it was obviously, it was exciting.
I had an inner feeling that it was okay, but it wasn't incredible. And uh, that's the way it was. That's exactly what happened. It wasn't an incredibly well accepted album, but it was like an initial beginning for the group. How did it do in England? Pr pretty well. It was, uh, I say it wasn't over, overly accepted. It was just nicely accepted. And we started to get a name going for ourselves. And that's the, the main thing to be doing. I mean, if you have a the number one album with your first album. I mean, that's something else. <laughs> something you, can't, you can't even think about uh, things like that. Uh, on the second record, with the string arrangements, were those used in lieu of a Mellotron or...? Yeah, I, f I felt so. Mm -hmm. At the time, um, I'd started listening to a lot of classical music, starting with... The, the Planets? Uh, the Planets, Dvorak, uh, Tchaikovsky, um, generally centering around that area. Uh, it was exciting. Mm -hmm. I felt very strong about uh, orchestration at that time and wondered if we could ever, as a group, get that together on stage especially. To be able to go on stage and sound like an orchestra would be incredible. <laughs> so we had a lot of talks about this and uh, after a while we decided that the, the Time and Word album we would try and feature the kind of strings and horns and brass and so on. Mm -hmm. um, is that the album, that was the album you were introduced to Eddie Offord? Yeah, because right. Tony Colton produced that right. with us. Again, it was a, another situation where someone like Tony Colton could come in and he had a lot of experience in recording. And he was a musician, he was a singer and writer. And he did help us immensely at that time. We weren't sure, again, we weren't sure about what we wanted to put down sound-wise on record, so we got session musicians in. And session musicians are fine to a point, but in some ways they're not going to bend over backwards to really get off on what they're doing. Right. Unless uh, they're arranged to do so. And uh, the arranger that we had, I think it was Paul Cox, who was a very fine arranger, very well st studied arranger. He knew what he was putting down. Um, possibly didn't have the drive that I would have liked to have seen in, in someone to really get that, get them guys going. But it was just a matter of course that these things happened and we accepted them and enjoyed them immensely. I mean, it was a very enjoyable period. Looking back, I read one time, a few years ago, that looking back on Time in the Words, you felt the uh, lyrics were kind of immature, or the album was immature. Yeah. Just sort of overstatements. Grocery store, ten bucks. Just making change for plastic. Yeah, it's difficult, really, because. Um, you got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. you got to start to. Uh, putting your thoughts down and you, you have to start in, in a certain position. At the time, probably when I had that interview, I was thinking about it and saying that it was, it was obviously immature because that's what it was. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything wrong in it. It was, it was fine, you know. Yeah. Did you go through some sort of psychological resurgence in that era? Because the lyrics seem to reflect that, just so, so positive. Yeah, just a definite realization that uh, things were available if you want to work for them, and they were there. And there was a kind of definite feeling that we'd started on something, and it was going to go on for a long time, and that was it. Yeah. And it was very strong. Yeah, it, it sounds like that. It seemed like at that time, it was such it was a lot of the music reflected sort of burnout, and then there was this yes, the, the, lyrically on that album, just phew, very positive. The third album, uh, it seems like that was sort of a breakthrough album. Is that uh, correct? 
I feel so. I think it became the first group album. It wasn't produced by anybody, it wasn't organised by anybody but the group. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, with getting Steve Howe in the band, it rejuvenated a lot more sense of being what a group is. I could talk to Steve a lot easier about music, about what we could be doing, where we're going and so on. Yeah, we, we um, basically Eddie Offred came along and we got together, we, we'd been in the country for two months rehearsing the album and the big upheaval in management and Peter and everything, our first kind of guy who leaves the band and there was a big upheaval in management at the time and we were left stranded on our own. And it felt like we were stranded, and it made us more solid as a, as a group. And we didn't rely on anybody. Yesterday a morning came a smile upon your face. Caesar's father's morning glory in the human race. On a sailing ship to nowhere. We didn't rely on anything but the group. And we went in the studio on our vision, and Eddie was there, and we were a very tight situation, and we weren't going to budge. Any, anybody could walk in and say, you know, why don't you do this, try that. We weren't going to budge. We had an idea. We knew what we were going to do because we worked it out. And that's why the Yes album was the first important statement from the band in terms of really finding its feet. seemed to have a quality I just personally call cinematic rock in that like you could close your eyes and, and listen to Starship Trooper and you were flying through space hmm. did you try to accomplish that kind of feeling going in there or was that it just happened it, we, really? we, we had this again we had this strong sense that we were doing the right thing no matter what mm -hmm. we were doing the right thing and it was gonna happen whether what? whether people was gonna buy it or not is another mm -hmm. thing but we knew we were doing something and it was happening Excellent. And we didn't we, we didn't rely on a producer, a ranger, or anything. We just relied on the band as a group of musicians, and it was there. Yes, music. An evening with John Anderson. A Superstars Radio Network special will continue, right after this pause. Let's take Starship Trooper. What kind of environment did you? Right, construct that song. And I'm just trying to think, really. It's, it, it was um... because uh, just personally, and I know a lot of my my friends are into yes, just like Starship, especially when that first came out. It was like just like as revolutionary to music as 2001 was to film. It was just God, what is mm. this? <laughs> Oh, no. 
lyrics started to come out without too much thinking about it. They seem to write themselves. I mean, it's crazy to say that, but that's what happens after a while. You write a lot of lyric, and uh, I was writing about my inner self's vision of myself. Oh, and interpreting, interpreting that each person has this soul, if you want to call it a certain thing, has seen everything that that person is and knows everything about that person. And that's when I sing, uh, though you've seen me, please don't tell a soul. What you can't see can't be very whole. You don't have to tell me. I understand that you know, but I'm not to know. Do you understand that? I mean, it's, it's, that's where it came from, and it became a very spacey kind of thing, where there is a messenger within you that is always interacting with the life form. There's that point in within yourself that knows you. We call it God, right? And it's this point where uh, you say, Mother Life, all firmly onto me. Spread my knowledge higher than today. Release as much as only you can show. Because no, no matter how much you want to get clearer visions of what you're up to, you're only going to get a certain amount. Mm -hmm. You're only going to get a little bit uh, of the amount that you want, all this, everything you want. Um, you're only going to get a little bit of that, so I accept it that it is a little bit, but in fact, the little bit that you get is so incredibly m enormous. Mm -hmm. and that's oh, what it's all about. Oh. You forget about the rest, right. these things that you thought you wanted. Chris wrote the, uh, the, uh, the line, and we, we co-wrote the lyric. I remember I wrote to loneliness is a power that we possess to give a tickler forever. And Chris wrote, oh, I know that can be shown by your acceptance and the facts they're shown before you. Comcast Xfinity customer. Our system scans have detected malicious spyware and or viruses you on your computer. Your way. personal and photos, is, credit say, card information. So and then I think I wrote, as I see in your day me, I'll also show you and you may follow. Generally, the, the me's and my's, I's and we, are all generated from the listener, not the actual, what I think. I think the same, but it's, I've always thought that I and me and you is the listener mm -hmm. to the song. It is him, me, yeah. I. Yours is 
no disgrace Yours is no disgrace <laughs> Vietnam at the time, and kid, kids going out there who had to fight, and it's not their fault that they had to fight. They had to get into it. They had to get on top of it, or else they're going to get killed. And they had to get on top of the whole situation, and uh, that's what struck me that it wasn't a disgrace to fight, even though the most inner feelings of man is that it's the most cruel, degrading abysmal thing to be doing is to kill your fellow man but because of the energy and the atmosphere you sent to look after your country for some reason that you're not quite sure of so yours is no disgrace that was the song we were searching for a mood player right. and Tony wasn't quite into that side of things at the time, hence Rick, because Rick was uh, already ta uh, tampering with Mood and Mellotron, and we needed, as a group, we needed that colours, those colours right. to come along. Were you, uh, you were already recording uh, what, Heart of the Sunrise when the switch came? Uh, yeah. What, uh, what happened there was just, uh... Click, click, click. Tony couldn't, uh, quite get the feel you were looking <clears throat> It was, it was just, a, a situation where we discuss things, we discuss ideas, and if things aren't followed through, then you have to question why they're not following through, and if we can't come up with a, an appropriate meaning behind the question, uh, the answer is as to why we can't use Mellotron and Mood, then there must be something missing. And we have to find that missing thing. And if it needs that we find that missing thing by finding another person to explain the missing thing, then that's what, what it has to be. How did you come across Rick? Were you hit to the Straubs? Or was it just... Not really. We played a gig about six months before we met but Rick again, and he was playing, and he was young and very uh, energetic, very talented, uh, a kind of budding star in a way. Everybody was getting off on him very much, you know, as a keyboard player. And Steve and Chris had met him on occasions, and they'd mentioned that we could get together with Rick and have a chat and see what he thought about the idea. Song Close to the Edge, I think it's your first uh, long composition extended. Yeah. Was, is that about Siddhartha? Well, it's based on various things that were happening at the time. I was reading Herman Hess. The band was collecting a lot of material that could all fit together nicely and neatly without too much effort. Hence the idea of doing a long piece, a long composition. So uh, it just seemed while while I was reading Siddhartha Journey to the East with Damien, things started to formulate as to an idea for a long piece of music. And me and Steve sat down one day and started working out initial ideas and then Chris came along and we all got very involved in it and the lyrical content became a kind of dream sequence uh, in a way the, the end verse is a dream that I had a long time ago about passing on from this world to another world yet feeling so fantastic about it that death never 
frightened me ever since, you know. I think in the early days when I was very small, I used to be frightened of this idea of not being here. <laughs> but where else can there be <laughs> if there isn't here? And it just seemed a matter of course that uh, death being such a beautiful experience for man physical to go through as being born is. That's what seemed to come out of this, the song, that uh, it was a very pastoral kind of experience rather than a very uh, oh, frightening and oh gosh, oh, get I don't want to die. No Yes, music. An evening with John Anderson. A Superstars Radio Network special will continue right after this pause. Again, because we'd started off on this thing, this idea that we were going to carry on whatever came in front of us, we were going to attempt. It made us more resolute to stay where we were. Why, why try to be what the critics want you to be, or what possibly a lot of people would have liked us to have been. Mm -hmm. But what we were was what we were, and we couldn't back down from it and say, oh, we're sorry we did this, or, you know, and it was a great experience, and that is coming out in, in the present time. But it was a very exciting experience to go through making a piece of music.
One thing uh, always amazed me about Yes, um, the well, sort of really business-like attitude the group takes toward not only the music, just everything, just efficiency. Uh, That's important. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. It's so important. And it shows. And what kind of, uh, isn't it difficult to administrate? Who is in charge of coordinating the whole? Yes, from well, we all are, really. It's really a group effort. Yeah, and not just the group. It's the, it's the group of people around the group and the group the of people. Yeah, the road crew have been with us for a long time, so they know us and we know them, and we, we, we have a, a very, very strong feeling about the whole situation. And, and without one, we can't have the other. Without the band, there wouldn't be a road crew. Without a road crew, there wouldn't be the band. Right. You know, it's, it's that strong where we rely on their judgment at certain times. We rely on management, obviously, and close reaction from people close around us. When uh, Wakeman left, uh, you were going to hire or hire or work with uh, Vangelis. What was it? Which we, 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 I mentioned that uh, at the time there was this guy called Vangelis whose records I'd listened to, and he Very had bizarre. something that uh, really hit me very strongly and has done ever since. Uh -huh. So we, we worked out together and basically because we were a very strict, we have a strict re working relationship that we enjoy and he was a very loose character. He was possibly the opposite end of the stick mm -hmm. to the band. That's possibly why it didn't come about that we didn't work together. But we enjoyed the idea of working together. We enjoyed playing together, but to to make things in perspective, we, 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 we realized together that we, it wasn't going to happen. At the time we were rehearsing in Relayer, we had a few ideas coming up on Relayer as an, as an album project, and we would wait until the man came along who was obviously part of the band, who saw himself as part of the band, and that was Patrick. Interesting. Uh, Gates of Delirium is War and Peace. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, it was the, the initial thing again, because having attempted a, a kind of war theme earlier on in, in the development of the band, it seemed with the advent of uh, the possibilities of using electronic sounds and various other things that we developed through topographic that we had to get into some kind of exploration of still still more exploring to do in that field of, of trying to create a picture a, a, a kind of canvas in a way so gates of delirium became the focal point for a picture You didn't use a vision, right? Was it recorded in Chris's basement or something? Yeah, this was recorded at Chris's studio. He's got a studio. Mm. And th this was a fine kind of arrangement because we didn't have to worry too much about time, the time factor uh, of studios, where you, you don't want to overstay your welcome in a studio because a studio has a certain vibrance. And if it's your own, you feel a lot more relaxed and a lot more encompassed by your your, whole, your own energies. Right. And when we were doing topographic, we had a lot of problems with the first 24 track that was installed in Morgan, and we had a lot of problems. Morgan, yeah, we had a lot of problems with the 24 track machine. Periodically, every week, there was something going wrong, which slightly put us out of motion. But yeah, accepted after a while. And by the time we got to Chris's equipment, it was working fantastically well. And the band was again rejuvenated to finish the album, do the album. We found the missing link mm -hmm. to keep Yes on the, on the move. <laughs>
sound chest that came out as, as the strong kind of line of music that was happening around that time, that we were chasing a lot of things, a lot of ideas, and sound chest was a piece of music became that kind of explanation of our situation. It still tried to do it, we'd still done a pictorial kind of thing with the uh, case of delirium, and then we did the gentle kind of uh, to be over affirmation of a lot of things, how we felt about a lot of things, and still being able to construct. The sound chaser was uh, a kick in a slightly different direction. <laughs> Is uh, Eddie still working with the band? I heard. Not anymore. That, no. What, uh, what happened there? Well, Eddie helped us immensely along the way. He started wanting to work with other people, obviously feeling that uh, he had a little more to offer other people as well as yes. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, it was a, a amicable agreement that we would part company. We, we never stated how long for, we just said, okay, well, you go off and do what you, you feel you want to do. presentation is uh, it's a surreal <laughs> like yeah, yeah. The theater. Night. It's kind of the want to put on theater as well, a good visual, along with the music. It just enhances the evening rather than. It's not trying to cover up anything. It's not trying to say, well, we'll we'll have the big show because the music isn't really getting over, or vice versa. It's a complete theater idea that I've always felt was going to happen anyway right. with the band. Well, it just enhances the whole thing. Where I was sitting the other night, it was just like, there's yes, and the music is great, and the visuals yeah, are great. Yeah, hopefully they complement each other. Yeah, there's, there's kind of a, <clears throat> there's something always to see, and there's always something to hear at the same time. And if it's done well, then you're, then you're getting it together. You know, we, we hope we do it well. We, we try to do it uh, with as much taste as possible. And uh, it, it, it helps because it won't be seen again. Right. And it's been seen uh, for the last three 
years we've been on tour, it's been a different staging. And it's just imagery that won't be seen again. And it's worthwhile if you can, it, you know, it costs a lot of money to do it, but that's, <laughs> you know, what the heck? Right. I mean, it doesn't matter so much as long as we can keep going, that we can put on these kind of uh, shows that do leave some kind of statement and image in, in, in the in the mind of the people that see us and, and hear the band. Well, listen, I appreciate it. I guess, uh, yeah, that would be about all I have it's right now. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure. How about a little Fantastic. closing? A you quick, know, a quick uh, blast yes. from the past. You've been listening to Yes Music, an evening with John Anderson, interviewed by National Radio Consultant Lee Abrams. We hope you enjoyed it. I'm Sonny Fox. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>